sometimes our body holds on to stress in ways that we don't even understand. And emotional stress can raise our cortisol. It can cause us to gain weight. There's all sorts of things. But I think if you've gone through a prolonged period of trauma or abuse or stress, there are very real signs and symptoms of that in our body. And if we're not too careful and if we don't deal with that, then it can produce all sorts of long-term problems. So today I want to address the physical aspect of healing and the ways that God leads us to complete healing in all areas of our lives. friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. I know sometimes you doubt if you are truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own. I know that you are praying for a way to know the difference and to be confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word. If you are ready to grow in your faith and your identity in Christ and to confidently step into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, have you been feeling isolated in your walk with God? We have just come out of a long period of quarantine and isolation, and it can sometimes feel difficult to be connected to each other. And in fact, the enemy wants us to feel that way. I want you to realize that there are other believers that are feeling the same thing, longing to feel more connected to not only God, but to each other. I want to invite you over to my free Facebook community where we can connect with each other, talk through some of our struggles, encourage each other, and pray for each other. On Facebook, look for the She Hears Hearing Jesus podcast community page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Today we're going to be continuing our series on abuse. We've been talking about spiritual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, all sorts of things. And um, last week, if you didn't hear it, we had a special guest, my friend Kristen Klaus, who is starting in October doing a 12-week course on becoming fully restored from abuse. If you have not checked it out, there's a link on in all of my bios where you can check out some more information. She's doing a 12-week course that includes a workbook and videos, I think several videos a week, that works together. uh, through a group and then also through some one-on-one. She's a licensed clinical therapist and she has a background in this. She's also a spirit-filled believer and I know that you will find so much value in the content that she has to share from you. You can give her a follow and a like and kind of just follow along with some of the resources she has. Today, what I wanted to do was kind of follow up on one of the things that we talked about last week, and it kind of got a little bit of traction this week. I heard back from some of you about how you have to put the work in for your healing. And um, I know that that kind of sounds countercultural to a lot of Christian audiences. I think there is this tendency to think that you can just pray about things and it will get better. And while we definitely see throughout scripture how Jesus heals instantly sometimes, a lot of times that's not how it works or that's not the only way that it works. A lot of times what we see is, for for an example, with a medical issue, you know, um, our pastor actually talked about this week how he had a knee injury and he believed for 12 years that God would just supernaturally heal him. And it took him getting surgery to be healed. Now, God certainly used the doctors and the medicine and the technology to heal him, but it took a perspective shift and he struggled with a lot of guilt and shame over that decision. Um, but that was ultimately how God wanted to, to heal him. And so there's been a perspective shift now. And I think what has happened is is within the body of Christ, there's been some faulty teaching. Now, I am 100% a believer in divine, miraculous, instantaneous, supernatural healing. I've experienced it personally. I've prayed for people that have gotten healed. Sometimes that is how God heals. Other times, he leads us to educated physicians that have the knowledge and the skill to help us. And I think for me, when I had, I grew up in a, in a traumatic background, I had been involved in several, uh, you know, abusive relationships and I definitely had 
some things that I needed healing from. And my response to that was if I sought out healing or if I sought out a doctor or I sought out therapy or any of those things, then my faith wasn't big enough that I would should just have enough faith and God would just supernaturally heal me, especially because I had seen him heal other people. And so there was this constant tension of, well, you know, my faith must just not be big enough because God's not healing me. I want to say right now that um, you have to have freedom from, I want you to have freedom from that mentality because that's not biblical. That's not scriptural. Yes, sometimes God does heal supernaturally and sometimes he heals through doctors and medicine. And um, I think for me, one of the things that became very evident, especially in the last year or two, as I've been walking through a season of healing, I became committed to pursuing healing spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. And there was just a lot of things that were not adding up for me. I started um, running. I had carried a lot of extra weight. And as you know, stress causes weight gain and um, high cortisol and all the things that come along with a stressful environment. And um, everybody else that I knew that had that were runners, they, they would lose weight. I committed to a three-month uh, program for running at the end of the three months, including uh, a really healthy, careful diet, lots of water, all those kinds of things. I had gained four pounds and it's not like I am small, like I have a lot to lose, but yet I was doing all the things that I knew to do that, you know, every doctor says to do, you know, calories in calories out, all that kind of thing. And it, it wasn't working. And I got to this place where I was just feeling so defeated, but I knew that there was something wrong with my body. Like it wasn't just this, you know, bad health, unhealthy eating. It wasn't just lifestyle choices. There was legitimately something wrong when I was doing all the things that science said to do and I I couldn't lose the weight. And so I started to really look um, at maybe some additional issues and did a lot of research on cortisol. Of course, cortisol is the stress hormone that's produced when you're in a stressful environment. And I realized that I basically lived off of cortisol. Like it was kind of, I had a steady diet of cortisol since I was a kid. And although I could recognize it, I didn't know what to do about it. So Um, that's kind of going on in the back of my mind. And then we started having some issues with one of our daughters. She was learning how to drive and she kept hitting things. And she's a very smart, very intelligent, top of her class, and normally does not have issues, has 20-20 vision. But she started hitting things like a garbage can and, you know, a, a pole. And it was just like, what the heck is going on? Really had a hard time teaching her how to drive. And so we took her to an eye doctor. The eye doctor said, well, her eyes are 20-20 vision. I can't find a single problem wrong with her. I want you to take her to an auditory specialist because sometimes the auditory nerve can get things confused and make peripheral vision off and those kinds of things. So we ended up getting to an ocular specialist who specializes in um, like a neurology type practice. Um, It's like an ocular neurologist. And Basically, what he said was that her sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems were off, and that's usually due to trauma. This is a kid that has never had a concussion, never had any kind of, you know, accident, you know, no broken bones, anything like that. And so I just really kind of didn't understand that. And I said, you know, trauma, she's not ever hit her head or anything like that. And he said, well, it could be emotional trauma. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because um, the emotional trauma that she would have suffered would have been when she was like two or three years old. And now she's, you know, 17. And so we're trying to figure out what that means. And, you know, so he puts her on a treatment plan. Um, She ended up doing therapy and light therapy and all sorts of things. And actually she's a hundred percent healed now. God has really um, done a really miraculous work in her. And in fact, she just got her driver's license this last weekend. So as I started thinking about that, I thought, man, um, if she has trauma, what, what about what (laughs) she's, she's lived a pretty protected life. Um, you know, since the time, you know, she was pretty little, she's had a pretty protective life. So if she had that kind of trauma that would mess her up that much, um, 
I, maybe I should get checked out. So I made an appointment with the doctor and he said, well, have you had any kind of concussion or brain trauma? And I said, you know what? I, uh, I've had a lifetime of, um, physical, emotional, spiritual, all of it. And so he said, well, let's bring you in. We'll do an evaluation. What he found was that the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, just like my daughter was out of balance. And one of those systems works for your rest and digest. So your sleep, your, uh, your gut, your, you know, the physical side of things. The other side of that is like your get up and go, your um, fight or flight. And so basically what he found was my fight or flight was so elevated that my rest and digest was so depleted. And um, in the case of my daughter, it was pretty easy to get her rebalanced out. And, um, you know, within a couple months, she was pretty much back to normal. Um, he said to me that whereas most people experience certain times of stress, he said, in my brain, there was like a super highway for stress. And that didn't surprise me at all. And I had explained to him some of the issues I had been having and uh, just with difficulty losing weight and just um, hard time sleeping and migraines and all kinds of things. And he said, all of those are stress responses in the body. And the funny thing is, is I was in a season that was the least stressful of my entire life. And I, I hate to say that because I don't want to downplay the pandemic and quarantine because I know that that has been tragic for a lot of people. There's been a lot of death and a lot of sickness and job loss and a lot of changes. For me, it was actually an opportunity to pause and evaluate my life and look at the things that I was doing in light of what God was calling me to. And um, I transitioned into a full-time ministry role that was remote, working from home. So I was spending a lot of time at, at my house. We weren't running and going all the time because uh, of the pandemic. Everything was shut down. So my kids were pretty much just at home. We weren't doing sports and all those kinds of things. And so I had had a period of like a year of rest and I was walking or running every day. I was eating, I had time to make healthy meals. Um, we did not have that fast paced schedule. I was not traveling. Like it was really a season for me that I should have been well rested. Yet what was happening in my body is I had a super highway for cortisol and if we're going to talk about cortisol or stress in terms of lifestyle choices, uh, I did everything that I was supposed to be doing. I mean, we were eating organic homemade meals and um, very little sugar intake. And if it was, it was natural stuff. I mean, really lifestyle choices, when it boils down to that, um, my I couldn't have done anything differently. And so as he's explaining how this all works, he said, you know, for younger people and um, like in my daughter's case, they can bounce back a little bit differently and easier. And he said, for me, it was going to take a little bit more work. And in his role, he could deal with the physical aspect of things, but he said he needed to be an advocate for healing by sending me to other people that could help. Now, um, I also at that point was going through with one of my graduate uh, seminary classes, I was going through a class where we were doing um, kind of like a life map of all of the things that brought us to the place of where we were at. And so it also was a season where I was being very deeply contemplative about just the ways that the Lord had worked in my own life. And I realized that there was this intersection of this is how things have always been. This is how things are now. And where do we want to go from here? And the Lord has really given me this opportunity to really examine the rest of the trajectory of my life. And um, some of the things might sound hokey. Some of the things might sound like, oh, well, I can never do. Um, what I would say now is who I am now is not who I was a year ago. Who I am now is not who I was five years ago. Um, if you knew me in my 20s, uh, don't think that you know who I am now in my 40s. Uh, that's just the reality of it. Um, on top of maturity and life experience, I feel like there's been this, this level of healing that I could not have understood prior to starting this whole healing process. So the first thing that we handled, and this is what I want to get into with the 
whole aspect of you have to be willing to put the work in to get to your healing. Um, sometimes that means seeing a therapist and there's no shame in that. For some people it might mean medication and there's no shame in that. For some people it might mean lifestyle changes, changes in jobs, changes in relationships. There's no shame in that. And by changes in relationships, I'm not saying get a divorce or something like that. I'm saying, you know, there are people in our lives that fill us up and there are people in our lives that drain us. And the goal is to start spending more time with the people that fill you up and less time with the people that drain you. And that has kind of been a life motto of mine in the last couple of years because I'm at a place where I realize that I have to protect my own emotions and my own mental and emotional and spiritual health. And the way to do that is by setting that boundary and not giving so much of myself away that there's nothing left for me. And I think we do that a lot in the name of Christianity. We answer every phone call. We go to every event. We are attend every argument we're invited to. And that's not what God wants for us. It's not healthy. And we are not obligated to do that, especially if you're in ministry leadership. I think that there's this tendency to do that. And my caution with that is it is a quick road to burnout. I mean, I was literally told I was on the superhighway for cortisol. And that had come after a decade of very draining ministry and instead of being in a place of feeling fulfilled which is what I would hope would happen after a decade of ministry instead um, I just felt completely depleted and so um, a couple things that that I did that I worked through that I want to elaborate a little bit on Um, what I will say is in the past I I just used to live in fear of the mailbox the mailbox would represent for me Just the place I would find out if, um, you know, I got a letter from somebody complaining about something at the church or um, there had been just a personal issue with somebody and I would always find out about it with a letter. And I used to just live in dread of the mailbox. And if I saw a handwritten address, I literally would have a physical response like my heart would start beating super fast. I would feel like I couldn't breathe. I don't, I would never would have called them a panic attack, but that's probably what they were. I just was a Christian. So I would not ever admit to having a panic attack or even exploring that opportunity, but it's probably what it was to the point where like, I can't think I can only hear my, my heartbeat in my brain. Um, you know, my pulse is super fast and I would just have this visceral physical response that would happen every time I would enter into a stressful situation. And so If I had to have a difficult conversation with somebody that was attacking me over something at the church or um, an issue with, uh, you know, any kind of authority, like if the principal needed to talk to me about one of the kids, I have really good kids. They're not in trouble. If anything, it's like they're the math Olympians. But I would, you know, if I got that message, we need to have a talk. Um, Can you come see me? I just would have this physical response. And I think that goes back to childhood because of the extreme... um, abusive type of discipline that I experienced where I just would have physical responses to any kind of authority. And so I did not connect that with stress. I did not connect that with cortisol or it was just, I I knew that about myself. Like, yeah, I can't, I can't handle that kind of stuff, but I didn't know how to do deal with it. I didn't know what to do with it. I just assumed that I could just pray about it and it would go away. And so what the doctor did, and this is incredible, um, he explained, and he's a believer, he, he explained how God has created our brains to heal. And the whole field of neuroplasticity, meaning um, the ability of our brains to stretch and uh, heal, is kind of a rather new industry or new science. I think it's been like the last 20 years that they've realized that our brains have the ability to to really deeply heal. And, you know, it makes sense because if you cut your arm, um, you know, the, the cut will eventually heal up. Or, you know, if you damage something, you can a lot of times work towards therapy and, you know, those kinds of things, but they didn't really connect that to the brain. They thought if there was brain damage, then that's just how it is. But the reality is, is God has wired us for healing, but we have to have the right tools for healing. And so there was a therapy, um, called syntonic light therapy. And what it does is it takes different kinds of light 
and um, they have basically goggles that you wear that are different colors and they have a certain kind of light that you use and for just a couple minutes a day um, you view the light. It's very similar to being in um, the healthy blue light from the sun in you know good weather where you're not like UV light but the the kind of um, you know you'll you'll hear about it with uh, in the summertime people do better because they have higher vitamin D levels. And in the wintertime, they end up having like, I think it's called SAD, where it's seasonal affective disorder because you're not getting enough light, uh, full spectrum light from the sun. So they have, you know, light lamps that people can use in the wintertime to produce that synthetic light. It's the same idea, except that light is the full spectrum of colors. What the syntonic light therapy does is it pinpoints certain colors that produce certain responses in the body. So there are certain colors, I think it's the blues and the greens, that calm down your nervous system when you are in a fight or flight mode, which is what I needed. And then there's other lights that increase. So for somebody that has like a depression or anxiety, uh, well, actually anxiety would be fight or flight, depression, um, lethargic, those kinds of things. It engages that system to respond in a way that it, it, it engages the nervous system to, to increase. And so uh, believe me, I'm not a scientist. I can't even explain this really well. I'm just telling you our experience. And so for a couple minutes a day, I would put on these bluish green glasses and then, and look at this light. And then a couple minutes a day, I would look through a red light and within, um, I would say the first week I did this for, I think two months, but I would, there was different shades of glasses depending on what my evaluation said. But within the first week I started sleeping through the night. I have been a person that has never slept through the night. I, um, as a kid, would sleep about four or five hours a night. And I'm talking like a young kid, like probably from age 11 on. And I've been drinking coffee since I was probably 12 because I would be tired in the morning, but I could just never sleep. And some of that was environmental. Some of it was fear. Some of it was stress. Some of it was I was staying up super late because I found a lot of identity and making sure I got really good grades. And so um, there's a lot of things that go into that. But even as an adult, um, a full night sleep for me, like a full, full night sleep for me would be maybe four or five hours. And people would say to me all the time, oh, you know, how do you get so much done? Um, I wrote the majority of my books uh, between the hours of 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. Because I would have this second win where my brain would kind of just not shut off. So I, I would be productive and I would work towards things. And that's how I got a lot of stuff done. Um, so for me to sleep eight nine hours was unheard of. That was two nights worth of sleep for me. And so obviously something was happening, something was going on, something, you know, these lights were doing something. And so after a month I went back and he did another evaluation and he said, you know, you have really made a lot of progress. He said, there's a couple of the things I want you to try. Um, the first was a pair of glasses I, like my daughter, had 20-20 vision, and she didn't need to go in depth with any of this kind of stuff. But for me, my tr my trauma had been so long and for, for such a long period of time and so intense that I needed a little bit more. And so he gave me this pair of glasses, and this pair of glasses basically tilted everything because he said because of the amount of trauma I had experienced, um, everything was shifted in my line of vision. So everything was pitched forward. So where I would stand still, if you and I were standing next to each other, everything in your environment would be fine, but in my environment, everything would be pitched forward. So I would overcompensate that and I would try anyway. And what would end up happening is I would run into things. I would run into the wall. I'd run into the furniture, furniture that stays put, like the dining room table. I would run into it every day. I can't tell you how many times I've broken my toes. Like uh, I, I don't even go to the doctor for it anymore. I just, you know, tape it up suffer through it. But I have had so many broken toes from hitting my toes on furniture. And that apparently was all connected. And so I put on these glasses and everything in my environment um, looked like it was tipped. And I had my family put on the glasses and for them, they looked clear. They looked like there was nothing. They were just clear glasses. For me, everything looked tipped, which caused incredible, terrible migraines. And so I was supposed to be wearing these glasses like even just working up to working, wearing them all day long. And I couldn't get past 10, 15 minutes. They would trigger these terrible migraines. And so I went back to the doctor and he said, 
let's check some things. So he works through things and he sits down and he said, this is really hard to believe. And I said, what is it? And he said, we never see this. He said, this is really, really rare. Um, apparently my brain processes things upside down. And so when he gave me the lenses, when we flipped them upside down, it was like a cool drink of water on a hot day. It calmed my eyes and almost immediately my headache, I always had, I always had a dull headache. My headache went away. And he said, when you view things, they kind of come into your brain and your brain flips them upside down and that's how you process them. So he said, when we flip these, what it's going to do is it's going to calm down that ocular nerve. And so within, so I went home and I had to get the glasses remade and, um, within, I want to say a week of wearing them, I started wearing them nonstop because they calm, they just seemed to calm everything down in my body. I was, uh, again, sleeping better. I was having less and less headaches. I just found myself just much more calm throughout the day. And so, um, you know, two months in, doing the light therapy, wearing these glasses. He said, you, you don't have any evidence of brain trauma in your, in your brain anymore. And I, and I was like, what? And he said, the person that came in the door two months ago is not the person that's walking out the door. And, um, he gave me a couple other suggestions that, which I did follow through on. We'll talk about in a minute. But what he said to me was, um, he said, there's another piece of this. And he said, I want to know that where are you at in understanding that this was a gift? And I said, what do you mean a gift? He said, all of the trauma that you experienced as a child and as a young adult and even into adulthood, he said, where are you at in understanding the gift that that was? And that question, um, I really had to sit with for a while and, I'll tell you, this is the most incredible eye doctor ever. And I just pray you find um, physicians in your life um, because he's amazing. But I had to really sit there and and, and think about it. But yet, um, I wrote a book during the pandemic that points people to Jesus and how to hear him and how to walk through some of our spiritual trauma. And I could, I could get... I've had a lot of training. I've had a lot of experience. I know how to work through things spiritually, even emotionally. You know, there's people that I have spent a lot of time with and um, talked through things with. I know how to get there emotionally. Uh, Physically, in my body, I couldn't do it on my own. And I really needed his help to understand what was going on with my body, to seek out the resources. There's no way in a million years that I could just figure out that I needed these special glasses to flip things upside down, to re-trigger my brain to heal. There's no way. But yet that's exactly what I needed. And God sent me this um, amazing physician to help me work through those things. It, it was a pain in the butt to uh, you know, carve out 20 minutes a day to do light therapy. Yeah, kind of, especially in the summertime when you, you know, you want to be on the go and go get ice cream or whatever it is. Um, but, but I had to put the work in the other, the other thing that he had me do was go work with, um, an acupuncturist and acupuncture is one of those things where a lot of the Christian circles shun it because it is, you know, seen as Eastern science or Eastern religious kind of thing. And while there definitely is an element to that, um, it has made huge strides in science and in medicine. And there was an acupuncturist in the next town over for me who was medically trained in acupuncture, not Eastern medicine trained, but, but literally has chased the science of different points on the body that engage different aspects and different systems. And so they specifically have acupuncture points that trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. The sympathetic is the fight or flight. And of course, my fight or flight was elevated and we needed to engage the rest and digest. And so um, she started, I I was scared. I was really scared. I didn't want to do it. Um, But yet I was deeply committed to chasing and putting the work in for my healing. And so she started the first time with just three 
just three three needles. Um, that initial pinpoint was a little bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't even say it was painful. But then they leave it in for a good 20 minutes where you just rest and you let, you let your body work. And what I found is immediately I felt... The only way I could describe it is that feeling when you're starting to fall asleep and you just kind of feel completely relaxed. That's what I felt on that table with needles sticking out of me. And I never anticipated that. But yet what it was doing is it was stimulating the nerves in my body of my nervous system that it needed to. And um, I did that for about six weeks. And every week she would put additional needles in different, different parts of the body that it would engage the nervous system. And I'm telling you that I am not the same person that I was when I started all of this. Um, the other thing that she, she engaged with was breath work. And this is so simple and I'm going to share it with you because it has been life changing for me. In those moments where I feel myself getting worked up, and sometimes there's a trigger. Um, it's not like all of those triggers have gone away and I don't ever get triggered anymore. But when something stressful happens or something that is, is engaging that stress response, um, I've been taught now how to breathe through in a way that calms my, my nervous system. And so, and, and you'll hear this in different kinds of therapy sessions. People talk about it dealing with panic attacks. We practice it with my daughters when they're getting worked up and emotional. Um, it's very, very simple. It's breathing in for a count of four, holding your breath for a count of six, and then releasing slowly for a count of eight. And you repeat that four times. And I'm telling you, even like we tested it, uh, uh, <laughs> I always get nervous on planes. We flew for our family vacation and I started to get a little bit just kind of nervous. I did the breath work. 100% fine. It engages the parasympathetic nervous system to calm yourself down, to calm your system down. So when I'm in the middle of a stressful situation and I can feel my heart starting to race, I do the breath work in for four, hold for six, out for eight. And I repeat that a couple of times. You can do it for up to four times. Um, but I probably by the second time, I'm almost better. Sometimes I'll do a third time just to kind of make sure. But you can do it up to four times. And what you'll notice is the more you do it, the more you train your body to calm back down. Um, with my daughter last night, she was kind of getting overwhelmed with homework. Homework's a little bit difficult for her. And so she's starting to get ready. I can tell as a mom that she's getting ready to cry. And my husband did the breathing with her and she calmed right down. It's so simple. It's breathing, but yet nobody had ever taught me that. And yet my encouragement for you is to realize that um, it's not sinful or it's not wrong to get help from people that can help you, that, can, that are trained in the body on how to reduce stress. If you have walked through a stressful situation, a stressful lifestyle, a stressful, triggering, abusive, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is, situation, it's very likely that you have some of these physical responses in your body that left unchecked can contribute to a lot of issues. For me, it was weight gain and insomnia and migraines. That was the primary. And like this physical, visceral response to perceived threat. I mean, like heart racing, all those kinds of things. Um, for, for you, it might be, you know, for some people it's heart issues and that, that's where a lot of heart attacks end up coming from. Or, you know, there's a lot of different ways that that comes out. Stress, stress can come out in a lot of different ways in our bodies. But I think I'm saying all this to kind of synthesize this idea that we have to put sometimes the work in, in order to um, get to the other side of our healing. That might mean going through a program like Kristen's where, where we're addressing the trauma and working through things. I had done that kind of on my own through my spiritual counselor, through a, a spiritual formation class I was taking. Um, and I realized how much value you is, so much value there is. But we have to address things, not just from a spiritual perspective, not just from an emotional perspective, but from a physical perspective. And if we ignore the physical perspective, there's this part of us that is not going to get to the other side of our healing because it needs to be addressed. Um, 
of course, continue to pray for divine healing, of course, and I will continue to pray for that for you. Um, but don't do that to the neglect of the physical healing. And maybe acupuncture isn't right for you. Maybe, you know, the eye doctor thing, syntonic light therapy isn't for you. Um, there are other ways to do it. EMDR is a really popular uh, way to treat some of this stored trauma. Um, another way, and this kind of people land on both sides of the fence with this. Another way, uh, is yoga. And again, yoga is one of those things where, um, people are very nervous about it because it has its roots in Eastern mysticism. However, I would encourage you to check out Christian yoga. I think if you Google, Google it, it's either christianyoga.net or christianyoga.org. I went on there and I found a Christian yoga practitioner um, that was, again, another town away. So I don't go as often as I would like to. But um, I went and let me tell you what I experienced because I was really nervous. I had been taught that yoga was bad and evil and stay away from it. When I walked in the room, it was a room full, full of uh, believers and the woman that was leading it, had a, a experience as a exercise, you know, leader, I think it was jazzercise or something. And she herself had really started seeking out ways to heal from some stressful situations in her life. And so it, it is a, they've taken the science behind yoga and they have coupled it with Christian philosophy and practice. And so it's worship music and stretching and engaging muscles the way that God created us to. It's our bodies just because they 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 have created this Eastern mystic, mystic religion around it doesn't mean that God isn't the author of how our bodies work. And so through a series basically of stretching, this wasn't vigorous yoga. They're not doing downward dog and some of those kinds of things. This is literally laying on the floor, stretching your body in different ways while listening to worship music. And I'm going to tell you what happened to me. And different people have had different responses. I took my daughter and she had a very similar response to, to what I did. There was an exercise where they did where it was really just your your upper body is is laying flat on the mat. And then your lower body is twisting. So your hips kind of twist over and it kind of twists your back to the point where your, your left hip is then on the floor of on the right side. And when we hit that, emotion rose up out of my body and I found myself to be weeping. And yes, sometimes the, the worship, you know, can produce that kind of response, but that's not what this was. I physically released some sort of emotional trauma that had been stored in my muscles and my bones probably. And it wasn't until I fully stretched that, that I just felt this release. And I, and as I was weeping, she came over and she just prayed for me. She just silently prayed for me. And the Lord used that to release some things that I had been holding on to that I didn't even know I was holding on to. And so um, I do Christian yoga now and I don't have any checks in my spirit about it. And listen, I'm a spirit filled believer. God has given me a gift of discernment. There's a lot of things where I stay away from that you probably would disagree with, like, uh, you know, just different books and media or people or situations. I shy away from it because that, that Holy Spirit in me says, uh, uh, here's a check in your spirit. Get away from that. Nothing in me rose up against it. Instead, what I found was the presence of the Holy Spirit in that room as I worshiped, as I prayed, as God released things in me that I needed to release. And so maybe for you, it's Christian yoga. Maybe for you, it is starting in a place of prayer and saying, okay, God, give me some wisdom. These are just some ways to start chasing down some of those rabbit trails. And I'm telling you what, I have read probably 20 books on neuroplasticity and um, neurology and the way that God has created our brain to work. Our brains are fascinating and the way that our brain works with um, our muscles and our nerves and our nervous system, really it's a protective mechanism and it's a way to um, survive in very traumatic scenarios. Um, the vasal vagal response, you could, you could do some research on that and how um, God has just wired our, our brains to work and how to lower our stress responses. Um, all of that to say... But sometimes you got to put the work in to get to the other side of your healing. Am I 100% there? No. 
I still have some physical things that I need to work through and um, some hormonal things that, uh, you know, that's a, that can get disrupted because of stress. There's definitely still, still some things that I need to work through. Um, but I'm committed to doing it because I see the results and the wisdom that God has, the way he's put our bodies together and created us to heal. There is no shame in that. And in fact, I would hope that by the end of today, you would realize that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you don't have to live bound by the things that the enemy has kept you bound with. And so I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. And if you have questions, I know I threw a lot out there today. If you have specific questions about any of the therapies that I talked about or um, different ways that uh, I can help kind of point you in the right direction or maybe somebody in your area, um, please reach out. I'm, I'm here. I'm already praying for you. So give me something specific to pray about. Um, I would, I would count that an honor and a privilege to be able to pray and walk alongside of you. Check out Kristen's program if you haven't already. Um, and then also explore some of those therapies. Look at Christian yoga, look at some of the things that I talked about and see if any of those feel right. Pray about it. See if any of those feel right for you. Um, but my hope is that you won't stay stuck. I spent a lot of years being stuck. And I just decided that I don't want to be stuck anymore. I want to live a life of freedom. And that includes physical freedom from the things that the enemy has used to keep me bound. And that's my prayer for you too. So um, have a great week. I'll talk to you guys next week. And I'm going I'm to pray before we go. Father God, thank you so much for my friend that's listening today. Thank you that you have created her or him to heal that you've created our bodies to heal, that you are ultimately the healer. Lord, I thank you for the supernatural times that you instantaneously heal us. I thank you that that's who you are. But I thank you that it's also who you are to um, heal us through the therapies of wise doctors that have spent years studying the way that our bodies work. Lord, I come against any feelings of shame or judgment or criticism for seeking out therapies or medication. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help my friend to feel released of that and you would help them to pursue healing, physical, emotional, spiritual healing in a way that they find the true freedom that you have offered them through Jesus. Lord, I thank you for wise doctors, and I pray that even now you would start to prepare ways for uh, my friend to recognize different therapies and different doctors that can help. Lord, I pray that you would help them to be brave and strong and step out into um, that path, even when it's difficult and hard and uh, there's nerves there. And I pray that you, your presence would be with them. Lord, we know that we don't, we don't go it alone. So Lord, I pray that you, there's nowhere we could go that you're not. So I pray that you would already go before them and prepare the way for them and make that rough path smooth. Lord, I thank you that you do that for us through Jesus. I pray for my friend this week that they would have a good week. They would sense your presence, calling them and drawing them in. In Jesus name. Amen. I'll talk to you next week, guys. Have a great week. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.